Welcome to Season 8, Episode 40 of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we have some interviews from OggCamp, and we've also got a command line love, and we'll go over your feedback. I'm Martin, and joining me this week are Alan. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. And Mark. Hello. And joining us again from Australia, Nick. Hello. Hello, Nick. Thank you very G'day, much for coming sorry. back again. <laughs> <laughs> That's more like it. I was going to say, we didn't recruit an Australian to come on here and say hello. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I hope you're drinking Fosters. I, well, I've got Victoria Bitter on my table, but it's uh, pretty early in the morning, so I'm on the coffee, to be honest. Half, half seven in the morning. <laughs> oh, I come on. Yes. It's, still, it's nearly half eight now. It's okay. Although some people do consider Fosters to be breakfast beer, yes. We don't, no one even drinks it here. It's a, it's a tourist thing. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's like saying to uh, an English person, no, so you, dr- you drink bass? And it's like, no, nobody drinks bass. No, because I'm not from <laughs> well, the 1970s, that's why. I, ac- I actually had Foster's when I was in the UK last year, and uh, it's actually brewed differently. It's not actually Foster's. They just use the brand name Foster's. It's uh, actually Carlton Draft. Outrage. Right. Yeah. So, Alan, what have you been up to <laughs> since last we spoke? I've been automating myself out of a job again. Uh, the people keep, um, people who are developing apps for Ubuntu phone and they don't have a phone, uh, they develop on the desktop and then they send me their apps and say, Hey, can you test this on your phone? And I got a bit sick of that. So, um, you know, much as I'm willing to help people, it's very time consuming for me to do that. So I've set up a bot where you go to a web page, uh, upload your click package and put in your email address and the click package gets sent to a phone. Uh, it runs the application, takes a bunch of screenshots, grabs all the log files, and then emails them to you. And I wrote that with um, Stuart Language over the weekend, and it was jolly good fun. Cool. That does sound very useful. So, uh, Nick, what have you been up to recently? Uh, well, not too much uh, as of the last week, but I did have a situation where I needed to uh, redo my computer, as it were. Um, installed the latest version of uh, Mate, of course, and... Uh, Got that mentioned in early. Thank you. And um, one. and, and an Ubuntu the Studio. Um, yeah, checks in the post. Very good. And an Ubuntu Studio thing. But uh, here we go. I'd like to warn everyone um, with DD. Um, obviously, I cleared some hard drives, had my backup drive nice and ready sitting on the side to copy data over. Um, went to make a bootable uh, USB and uh, accidentally DD'd over the... Uh, backup hard drive. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Oh, dear. Yeah. So I, I did try to do a photo rec to um, get some stuff back, but uh, you know what? Sometimes it's easier just to lose the data and start again than uh, yeah. filter through a whole bunch of uh, nameless uh, files uh, saved from a recovery program. Wow. Yeah, well, my, wow. Uh, my first attempt to install Linux uh, involved deleting the partition table on my parents' computer. <laughs> It's amazingly how quickly you can become an expert in something when you trash your parents' yes. computer. Yeah, this is how I got into well, I now computers. Know how to never do yeah, that again. Yeah, exactly. So, what have you been up to, Mark? Uh, I've been doing a bit of gardening. Um, we've had some fairly substantial wins in the UK over the past oh, few weeks. Not, not virtual gardening simulator or some no, other no, Steam game actual, with your Steam actually controller. Walking not making a robot that house. does the gardening for you. <laughs> Actually walking outside Actual of my Actual interaction with organic matter. Pruding some dead bits off plants and putting my greenhouse back together and screwing it to the wall so the wind can't blow it around. Mm. Mm. Um, well, when, yeah. when I replace all of my uh, lawn with AstroTurf, I know who to, uh, who to recruit to come and help then. Actually, my, my <laughs> girlfriend's grandparents did that. Speaking of grandparents, my, uh, my wife's grand, uh, grandfather uh, father is just... Uh, uh, retired so i'm hoping that i can outsource all my gardening stuff to him because he's not going to be very busy at the moment maybe what about you martin what have you been up to uh well i was inspired by a talk that Stuart language gave at og camp where he explained how bad voltage automate the publishing of their podcast so once they've got the audio mastered by jono it then uploads the audio and the show notes to different places and does all of the format conversions and stuff like that. And he explained this was extremely useful, but largely coded for their purposes. So I looked at his code and I've started to make a more generic solution to that. So we published the last show using 
that script and it still needs a little bit of work but um i'll have a link to stuart's uh, a youtube video of stuart's talk at og camp this year and also the source code for what i've called pod publish and if anyone wants to dive in and help improve that they're more than welcome awesome so that publishes podcasts to mm. typical places like WordPress and PodPress and YouTube and all that it kind of stuff. It does, right? yes. So there's a number of so WordPress, YouTube, and SFTP for uploading at the moment. So um, it will probably need a, a traditional FTP handler for things like Libsyn, for example. And then we need to think about how we handle the different WordPress plugins. Some people use PowerPress, some people use PodPress, and there are others. And I haven't. Ha- done any of that bit yet because that needs some thought but um it it does you know publishing show notes to youtube and linking all of this up and it does all of the audio encoding as well so the mp3 and org and mkv encoding well system a you will definitely take a look at that uh uh, in the new year um save us a lot of time hopefully that's the plan yeah excellent yeah, it'd be good to get some uh, contributions from other podcasters who do things differently yes, as well. Yes, yes. Make it a super flexible, comprehensive yeah. tool. Awesome. Good work. Right. Let's get on. As you'll know, a few weeks ago, we were at OGCAMP in Liverpool. Uh, While we were there, I recorded a few interviews with um, people who were exhibiting. uh, And, well, we're going to play them for you now. So first up, uh, we have an interview with Entroware. I'm at OGCAMP talking to Anthony Pitch from Entroware. Hi, Anthony. How's it going? Yeah, it's going great. I'm having a great OGCAMP, so... Excellent. That's good to hear. So we've uh, we've spoken a bit about Entroware before on the show. We reviewed some of your machines um, a few months ago now. Uh, so just tell us a bit about who Entroware are and what you're doing at OddCamp. Sure. Uh, well, we're a Linux computer manufacturer, and we're basically here to fill the gap in the market of Linux support on hardware. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're here at OddCamp basically to get our name out there. Cool. And to and you're one of the sponsors as well, is that right? Yeah, yeah. the uh, platinum sponsor We've got stage named after us, which is excellent. Awesome. Yeah, I, I did just I did a talk on the Entroware stage earlier. Yeah. Uh, so, and you you're based in Liverpool, is that right? Yeah, we are here. Excellent, based in Liverpool, which is convenient. Yeah. So, so you're. I don't think there are any other uh, UK-based companies who do pre-installed Linux uh, hardware. Is that right? As far as we're not aware, not to the degree that we are. No. no. Right. So you've got uh, you've got a few um, a few devices with you today, including the Aura and the Proteus, which I reviewed on the show before. Yeah. Uh, you've also got um, a sort of Ultrabook style device. What's that one? Yeah, well, uh, the Apollo uh, we've had since January, and it's just had a nice upgrade. Yeah, it's now shipping with Skylake chips. Okay, and it's, so that's the new Intel architecture. Yeah, it's the sixth generation. Right, yeah. and uh, that basically means that there's more battery life, uh-huh. which is absolutely awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's really cool and quiet, uh-huh. and uh, it's got a nice backlit keyboard as well. So cool. Uh, and you run the, you we sell these uh, running Ubuntu, is that right? Yeah, Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate. Right. Okay. Yeah, Fifteen cool. ten. And that's on. Is that on all of your devices? Yeah, we offer that on all of them. Yeah. Cool. And what's it been like making sure all of your hardware is supported? How does that process work? Um, basically, uh, it's trial of fire, basically. So say. Uh, 15, 15, 10 comes about, uh, we just install it, yep. see what the issues are, are there any graphics issues, are there any issues with the trackpad, for example, yep. and uh, we just might have to tweak a few configs to get things working, mm-hmm. especially with things like uh, it's Optimus. Right, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, there is a, a, a big process to mm-hmm. that. But, um, and do you do, do you, if you if there are problems, do you do the fixes in house, or do you go out to the community and ask them to help you? The, we do most of the fixes in house because yeah. it's literally a case of tweaking the configuration file. Right. Okay. Or if it's something more major, like uh, bringing gestures to the touchpad, mm-hmm. then we'll liaise with the likes of Martin Wimpress mm-hmm. from the Ubuntu Mate project. Yeah. And uh, he'll help us package something up. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've got another another device with you, which is uh, a prototype of a steam machine. Is that yes, right? Yes, it is. So is this an official uh, an official one? Yeah, uh, we've this? got a Valve yeah. partnership and everything. Uh, 
sound all the relevant forms. <laughs> uh, this is very much a prototype right. today. Um, it's not really production ready, but by the time we get the green light for it, yeah. probably end of November, it will be production ready. So okay. This is a massive tease for it. So. Right. So um, what kind of hardware are we talking about for that? Uh, it's desktop hardware. The ones we have today, uh, the Skylake i3. Uh -huh. <clears throat> It's got a GTX 750 in it yeah. and a 8GB of DDR4, mm -hmm. which is always And nice. what sort of form factor is it? Is it designed to, to sit um, under a desk or under a telly or uh, behind a couch? It, yeah, it's, it's probably best behind the couch or next to your television or something right. like that. It's you know small form factor. It's a mini ITX case. Right. Uh, specifically Corsa 250. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's basically all about the form factor because it is aimed at gaming in the living room yeah. so and what sort of um are there are there particular criteria which you've got to fulfill for it to be an official valve steam machine uh, basically the only requirements are that you ship with steam os yeah. and a steam controller right so so all the hardware in the form factor is yeah, up to you what there's, do you think a, there's is best? a lot of room for okay. like, decisions from our part there, yeah which is great and will that mean that you you then have SteamOS as an option on your other devices as well, or is this going to be exclusive to um, Steam machines? We're keeping it exclusive to the Steam machines because, uh, you know, having SteamOS on a laptop, we think, wouldn't really fit the use case. Yeah. Then uh, it also makes support much easier if we have one unit. Yeah. That, yeah. Cool. Great. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of our camp. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks very much. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, my my chat with Entroware. I found it really interesting, actually, um, that the only criteria for the Steam machine is that it has to have SteamOS and a Steam controller, and it's, everything else is you've got complete free reign. So there's no like validation process for it. It's not like it has to be certified as a Steam machine. Or did he not go into detail about that kind of paperwork? Well, when he was saying about about signing the relevant paperwork, I assume there is some sort of certification process there to make make sure that they are doing they are meeting those criteria. They're just not particularly why well yeah you know, they don't reach into what they're allowed to do very much it's just quite a superficial they have to have SteamOS and they have to have a steam controller right so if someone wanted to make a manufacture uh like super tiny you know lean type of device that has uh, actually isn't there a requirement for it to have a certain amount of disk space i, th I think well, it... I, well i think steam os requires a certain amount of disk space so therefore yes the knock-on effect would be that yes, the the right. device would have so to have you, a certain amount. You of could space. potentially do something quite small with like a mini ITX size, you know, if and and just do in and market that as an in home streaming kind of device. It, you'd be competing with Steam Link, unfortunately, but you know, there yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly options for you to create a Steam machine that's not, you know, double Nvidia cards in SLI and all that, you know, f top end machine. Mm. Yeah, oh, I mean, it, I, I, I would be surprised if anyone could compete with the Steam Link on price, though. If someone was going to go down that, like a company, right? But the Steam Link way. has a requirement that there is another machine on the network. That you can't, yeah. you can't use the Steam Link on its own. So, yeah. if you could make a machine that was, you know, low enough to be able to play um, casual Simple games, games. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, 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 for the higher end stuff, it farms that out to another machine on your network. Which chances are, if you've got a Steam account, you probably already have. Certainly, yeah. Interesting. It'd be interesting to see what uh, what kind of sales they get for uh, for the Steam machines, because yeah, there's there's lots of factors going on there. It's a, a retail Linux gaming machine, which there aren't many of on the planet, you know, anywhere. Yeah. So th it's already quite a niche, and they're a small player, you know, in in a giant market. My concern is with the uh, Steam machine as far as sales go is the fact that the kinds of people who are willing to use a Steam machine and either stream from it or set one up themselves are the kinds of people who really just want to set up a computer themselves as opposed to purchase one outright. They'll probably look at the price right. and go, oh, I could cobble that together myself a lot easier and for a lot less money. And no, not dissing Entroware at all. I've uh, seen their website and checked their products online. They're great, great service. But um, I just wonder. So do you think it's Steam more likely, uses. like uh, you know, a young kid who who you know puts a Steam machine on their their wish list or something, their Christmas list or something, a parent goes and buys it for them rather than them going and 
you know, buying it. I don't know. I, I, I'm finding it difficult to find where well, Steam machines fit. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. I, I, maybe someone like me who would want a Steam box in the front room and hasn't got the time and to actually put together a thing from parts themselves and just wants to go somewhere and run a Linux games console and knows that you can go somewhere to just buy one that's ready to go. Right. Yeah. And and I, I mean, I'm yeah. similar. I, I will not build a computer. I've, exactly, I've, yeah. I've not been there and done world. that. I'm over the age of 40 and I do not want to spend my life plugging stupid cables in confined spaces inside computers and cutting my hands to ribbons. I've done that. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'd rather someone else did that, cleaned all the blood <laughs> off and sold it to you. <laughs> right. Should we listen to, <laughs> to the uh, Ragware interview? It does it involve blood? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, let's do it. I'm Ockham talking to Stacey Driver from Ragworm. Hi, Stacey. Hi, Mark. So, tell us about Ragworm. What do you do? So, Ragworm is a prototyping printed circuit board manufacturer. Um, we specifically started the service to interact better with hobbyists, startups, and those people who needed prototypes um, in order to develop their products further. We wanted to make it accessible for everybody, easy to use, um, and UK manufactured. Okay, so this is for hobbyists who might be doing some sort of uh, electronics or circuitry with breadboards, and they've sort of they know now what how everything's going to go together, and they need a, an actual printed circuit board to uh, for what to make more permanent prototypes or to scale up to actual manufacturing, or is yeah, it all, all, of all those, things in between? All those sort of things in between as well. Um, it's it, it's making it easy to go to that next stage. So there's there's restrictions to what you can do with the breadboard stage, um, it kind of removes the need for people to set up etching tanks in hack spaces that might not necessarily be suitable or they don't want to um makes it fairly cheap and easy in order to kind of scale up to that next level mm-hmm. and then the way that the way that we set the service up means that you don't have to then go and find another manufacturer once you've done that prototyping stage we can then take you all the way through into volume and we offer lots of services as well to support people who are only just starting out in electronics things like our sanity check Mm -hmm. you can send us your files and we'll check them over make sure you've made no manufacturing errors before you've even placed an order with us right so where where do your customers come from are they generally sort of hack spaces and hobbyists or is it more you know you come to events and exhibit and go to other industry events and you get people that way where where do people find you um a big mixture we try we try to do as much as we possibly can to keep ourselves within the communities so we visit make affairs up and down the country tech events we do lots of networking at iot conferences and wearables things like odd camp um but also we do a lot of um commercial based things as well so we work with lots of companies um we trawl kickstarter for people that might need help right. um move uh, into the right. next level so we we try to get our customers from as many places as possible yeah. um and we just try to make ourselves as visual in the community so that people know who we are feel comfortable to talk to us mm-hmm. um and ask and ask any questions they might have cool so you're wearing some some badges with flashing leds on tell us about those <laughs> Um, the badges are something we've introduced recently. Um, so we try to, uh, as many events as we can, where we know there's going to be a desire for people to have a go at some soldering, um, and particularly with a lot of children, um, give them one-on-one tuitions about the best way to solder, give them really good techniques, um, and do them as a bit of a collector's item so you can pin them on your ragworm lanyard and collect the set, hence why I am currently right. covered in flashing badges. Okay. Um, now, I noticed um, that some of the PCBs you've got on display, you've got like loads of different colors and different shapes and designs is that something which you sort of you encourage people to do or are these just things that people have sent you they're things that people have sent us but it's something that we've um, really tried to pick up on and encourage people so there's a lot of people especially companies say for example Pimeroni, um, Alex Eames um, at Raspberry Pi TV um, mm-hmm. with the kind of hacker community the, the hobbyist community the Raspberry Pi the circuit boards have become very visual and people have stopped putting it in enclosures, which for us is great. Right, so people yes. are really getting that hardware experience. So you want something so, which people will yeah. want to see out of the case. So utilise right. utilize your circuit board as artwork as well. Yeah. We've spent a lot of time with our solder mask manufacturers um, looking at different colours, making them really visual, interesting. So we're doing lots of purples. We've... Um, Pimroni challenged us to make pink solder mask. Not the most successful. We, we we got somewhere close to it, but it actually doesn't exist. So, so they, they and, and it has to be a hundred percent visual. So that there can't be right. any visual flaws, which is a real challenge for a manufacturer. So what's what's complicated about colouring 
uh, circuit boards? Um, there's a there's a few challenges. It can, dependent on the colour that you're working towards, um, it can actually restrict your feature sizes. So you end up having to have thicker tracks. Your whole your minimum hole size is affected. Okay. Um, so it is. So there are things that you have to consider when you're going going into it um, mainly because the ink ends up thicker because you're mixing more pigments more properties Um, but also different colors have different uh, have different effects so yellow for example is particularly hard to expose with an exposure machine when we're doing the artworks um, because it naturally doesn't want to be exposed so there are lots of challenges involved in it and you just it's just having that discussion with the customer to get the best possible outcome Um, but it's not you know we can't we, we can't be dulux we can't mix to a pantone because sold resist obviously has properties mm. um and, and functions that it has on the board more than just visual so it, it's it's that meat of artistry versus technical specifications right. but yeah we, we, we like to engage in those custom uh, engage in those conversations with customers and be challenged and get better at different things and it gives us a very unique selling point as a manufacturer we think cool so uh, if people want to find out more about ragworm other than coming to our camp how can they do it um so we're very active on social media particularly on our twitter so Mm -hmm. we're just quite simply at ragworm right um we (coughs) we post blogs on our website so you can trawl through what's called our rock pool and find out things that are going on at ragworm different machineries different advances that we're making um, and you can visit that website at www.ragworm.eu excellent thanks very much you're welcome yeah. that was awesome <laughs> i had no idea that there was so much detail involved in the color of the mask i know i just thought oh you put a different color ink on what's what's yeah. wrong with that yeah <laughs> i had a chat to them on the first day <laughs> and i was awake. absolutely stunned at the breadth of what they do i had no concept yeah. whatsoever yeah and they've uh, they've been coming to old camp for years now it's really great to see them coming back they obviously uh, get a lot out of it I was going to say they've certainly expanded. I chatted to them. I went to the 2014 Og Camp, um, and I uh, remember chatting to the Ragworm table quite a bit. And uh, yeah, they've uh, certainly uh, expanded their um, their base uh, quite a lot. Excellent. Uh, so, have we got any more interviews left, Mark? Or are those uh, any... no? Those are those are all the ones that I I managed to record. Okay, and I know Martin dug up some videos of stuff for people who didn't come to Og Camp. Uh, yeah, so right found, if, even if you did go to Og Camp, or if you didn't, and if you want to get a flavour of what went on, we've got um, this will all be linked in the show notes. We've got uh, a video of Dan Lynch doing the introduction to this year's Og Camp. There's a short video collage of photos that was put together by the open labs um at liverpool john moore's um there's the video of the og camp podcasters panel that mark was representing the ubuntu podcast on Uh, and then we've got a blog post from dan wood uh and he was a first time Og og camper and his blog is entitled what i learned at og camp 2015 so if you've never been before and want the perspective of somebody that's new to Wog Camp, you can find out from there. And then in researching this, I found a new podcast, uh, the Tech Shed podcast, which is uh, put together by Ollie Clark and John Archer. And they, in episode four, and that, that's their fourth po- podcast that they've done so far, they have a retrospective on the Og Camp that was actually recorded at Og Camp. So, uh, yeah, just a little bit of follow on for those of you that want to find out more about Og Camp and what goes on there. Excellent. Nice one. Is that everything? I believe so. Cool. Now it's time for Command Line Lure. So uh, Robert submitted his command line love via our Telegram group. And those of you, I know, and those oh, of you what? that have been paying close attention to Twitter will have seen that we have a Telegram group where you can chat to us and share your ideas. And you can find that by going to ubuntupodcast.org forward slash Telegram. And if you're not already a Telegram user, you should be. And among other things, you can join our group and have a chat and share your command line loves, just like Robert did. did. And he says... I have a command line love for you. It uses the package discount or Python markdown and the terminal web browser links. I call it MDView and is a command line 
markdown previewer. It's very simple. And the command line is markdown dollar one wrapped in quotes, which is the name of the file that you wish to um, wish to view. Uh, and then you pipe that into links dash dash stood in and that will the markdown command will render the markdown file file as html and then pipe it into links and then you can preview your markdown in the links browser and oh, um yeah amazing. this dovetails quite nicely with the pod publish that i've been working on because our show notes are written in markdown so you can actually use this to <laughs> preview our show notes before we submit them for publishing so maybe this could be integrated in some fashion so i guess this is rent to, given that it's using the whole dollar one stuff i guess this is yes intended to yes use as a shell script yes or well you, you can just type it in at the command line but you yeah. could you could Mark, just type it in and put file the name, file name pipe in links right, dash cool. dash stood in yeah yeah or you could uh, yeah make that a uh, a shell script marvelous we love getting your feedback so please send it to us even the pointlessly mean stuff makes us laugh if it's short tweet us on at ubuntu podcast if it's less short but please no essays email us on show at ubuntupodcast.org if you'd like to discuss some of the things we talk about with other listeners post on our shiny new subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash ubuntu podcast or you can just leave a comment on the relevant show notes on our website ubuntupodcast.org and now it's time for your feedback uh Andy Smith, uh, of our glorious VPS benefactor Bitfolk, tweeted, Reached ep 26 of Ubuntu Podcast, where most of the cast admit to never having watched The West Wing. Hope ep 27 plus featured tales of them remedying this. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think he might be slightly <laughs> disappointed to learn. <laughs> no. Yeah episode don't mind so andy if you get as far as episode 40 i'm really sorry you'll discover that we still haven't watched it yeah i've never watch watched it, it either this week. Maybe, maybe we'll have to watch it while we're in our interseason break and nick 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 will appear to uh, fit in really well around here <laughs> he hasn't watched it either. just don't tell laura yes uh lopter tweeted to at ubuntu podcast uh, season 8, episode 30 was exactly the right length for me to shovel snow from the footpath. Um, that's something I've never experienced, <laughs> um, but that's great. Oh. <laughs> uh, do, do you just not get snow in the part of Australia where you're in? Uh, you, only get, you only get snow on mountaintops in Australia. It's very rare to get any real snow in our areas where people and actually when, live. And when it does, do you think the sky is falling? Uh, yeah, well, I've never actually seen snow aside from a mountaintop. Uh, at the moment, we've got the opposite. We've got total fire ban days around at the moment. It's uh, We're fluctuating between really weird 17 degrees and 33 degrees um, next to each other. Mm-hmm. One day will be 17, one day will be 33, and then there'll be bushfires everywhere. We can be all, you know, cocky about the amount of snow we have here, but I was with a Siberian a guy from Siberia once and uh, I said, oh, look, it's snowing here in the UK. And he looked out the window and he went, that is not snow. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, also on Twitter, uh, Michael Shane What Brown is the issue asked, with the network service on Ubuntu 15.10? Had to edit the network manager text file for the network. What's going on, Alan? Well, yes, indeed. That's a good question. <laughs> mm. oh. I have no idea. Uh, I tell you what, try you, askubuntu.com. Michael, can you let us know what text file you had to edit and what the change was? That would be helpful. <laughs> I, I would imagine, uh, just like plucking out of the air, I would imagine the file he edited was slash etc slash network slash interfaces, and he plugged in all the mm. details manually. Because if you do that... Gets network disabled, manager yeah. doesn't bother managing the interface. Yeah. So often when people have a problem with network manager, they resort to manually configuring the network in that text file. And that does work, but it means you can't then use network manager to, to like manage your network connection. But for some people, that's perfectly fine. If it's a desktop and it sits still on your mm. LAN all the time, it doesn't really matter. Um, so I would imagine that's what he did. I don't no. know why he did that. And I, didn't know if it's a widespread problem on 1510, but yes, ask Ubuntu or file a bug. The usual two responses to my system is broken. Ask Ubuntu or file a bug. Anton Piatek said, Very interested in your review of the Steam controller. Thanks. Have been wondering about that and the Steam link. 
You still using it, Mark? Uh, yeah, well, uh, the game I'm playing at the moment is um, Skyrim, which uh, I have to play through Wine, which I can use the Steam controller to do. The trouble is there's a bug in Wine, which means you get stuck walking in one direction. So I'm currently using um, uh, the Xbox controller, which is supported by the game natively. So um, when I'm playing other games that aren't Skyrim, then yes, I am still using it. Uh, still never tried a Steam Link because I've not got a setup that requires it. Super. Uh, Jarlath Reedy, sorry if I've butchered your name, pointed out. Today I learned most FOSS users recommend DuckDuckGo, which includes Amazon results. Yet there was uproar when Ubuntu did this. Lee sigh. <laughs> um, I suppose the, yeah, that's true. But I suppose the issue there is uh, DuckDuckGo anonymizes all its results uh, before it would go to Amazon, I would think. But uh, yeah, it's a... Uh, Q Ubuntu, uh, Q Alan saying Ubuntu does the same thing. Ah, do they? I, 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 I was going to say that. How did I guess? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we've I mean, the slight the slight difference is that with DuckDuckGo you're already searching the web, whereas with the Ubuntu Dash you might be looking for a file on your machine. Yeah, I suppose the best but the again, best example yeah. I heard earlier was somebody who wanted to start Brazero to burn a CD and just had their search results <laughs> filled filled with women's underwear with. Mm. <laughs> yeah that needs to go away uh cohen glosback uh who is glosback did you know Twitter about orphonic.com asked... just discovered it might be handy for the occasional balancing leveling issues though i'm not sure if web service goes against your open source standards well i'm glad uh cohen uh, appreciates <laughs> our open source standards. Yeah, i wasn't sure if this was meant to be helpful or if this was a gentle nudge in that our audio quality could be better well we I, have been i, I think we there was have a been bit advised a... to use orphonic several times whenever we yeah. had a show that wasn't quite up to par the trouble oh, is really well one of the troubles is that um you have to pay if you want to yeah. process the amount of audio that we do um and uh also in the situations where we have had um not up to scratch audio or it's because of um issues where off one it wouldn't be able to do anything with it we do do quite a lot of uh cleaning up and mastering in audacity i love so the way we're if, even like super pc about our own audio even when our own audio is terrible we call it not up to par <laughs> brilliant <laughs> I could say I could say other things, but this is a family friendly you could podcast. Say it sounds like it was recorded Many in a bathroom. Words are available for you to choose. <laughs> we get that a lot, uh, and that's all of your feedback. Thank you very much. That's all for episode 40. We'll be back next week when we'll have more news, comment and discussion. Thanks very much, Nick, for joining us the last two weeks and filling in yes, for Laura while she's been away. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, it's uh, been exciting, to be honest. Uh, as I mentioned pre-show, I've, uh, I've been listening to this podcast for a good old eight seasons now, so it's a little bit surreal to uh, know that uh, I'll be listening back and hearing my own <laughs> voice. <laughs> well, I've, uh, it's, only, it's, I've only been on it for about five so uh you've got some serious staying power it's it's not compulsory <laughs> for you to listen back to the episodes you're in i never do <laughs> oh no i'm narcissistic so i'll be there <laughs> okay uh so uh, i know you mentioned it last time but for those who didn't hear uh let everyone know where they can find the podcast that you're on uh yeah so you can just go to systemau.net.au uh for the episodes uh we are not safe for work so uh don't play us in front of your kiddies Unless your kiddies like that kind of thing, in which case, oh, of course, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. awesome. And I believe the next show will be the last, last one of two. the season. Yeah. Am I right? Last two, the last two of the season. Yeah. Ooh, awesome. Looking Bye. forward to that. See you Thanks, next time. Nick. Bye-bye. See you. Bye bye. Bye. stop recording.